kind, um, that wonderful dancer. <laughs> and then behind the guy who talked about aliens in outer space. So, you know, it's, it's just not going to be that exciting, I don't think. Anyway, uh, today I'm going to talk about how does evolution build a complex brain? It's a very big question. I always like to uh, put up this first slide of animal bodies because you can't just talk about a brain or a brain in isolation. The brain is enslaved by the body. Um, they go hand in hand in terms of normal behavior um, and how our brains work, but really importantly, how our brains evolve. Um, I'm interested in the neocortex. This is a, uh, actually, which one is this? Right here. Uh, this is a, a brain of a bottlenose dolphin. This is a brain of a small uh, marsupial in Australia, a native cat. And one thing you'll notice is the neocortex is this little teeny tiny cap on the outer surface of the brain. And in some species, it's expanded dramatically. <laughs> Um, this is the portion of the, the brain that I study. The reason I study the neocortex is because um, it's the portion of the brain that's involved in complex behaviors like cognition and language and all these um, sorts of things that we uh, associate with the human condition. It's also the, the portion of the brain that's changed most dramatically in species over time. My question is, how do we go from a simple brain of early mammals about 200 million years ago that had a few parts um, to a large, more complex brain with many parts, in particular the neocortex? So, in the, shot I, the slide I showed you of the bottlenose dolphin, the brain was clearly larger than that of, a, of a, that little marsupial I showed you. But what's more important is it has a lot of different functional divisions that are interconnected. So it's not that just that it gets bigger, it gets more parts. Um, the problem with studying evolution is pretty obvious. The types of changes, particularly getting more parts that are interconnected, take um, tens of millions to hundreds of million years to happen. And I don't have that kind of time. To, to study those species. So what do I do? Um, what do I do with this problem of, of this time um, constraint of evolution? I can, do, I can study this in two ways. I can say, what has evolution produced? I can study extant species. Evolution has produced brains. It's produced animals. I can study extant species. I can study their brains. And I can look at features of organization that are similar, possibly due to a com likely due to an inheritance from a common ancestor. And I can look at um, aspects of brain organization that are really different or that are, are derived. That sort of comparative analysis tells me what types of changes brains have, uh, have evolved over the course of time. Um, but it doesn't tell me how phenotypic transformations occur. How do I get more cortical fields? How do I get changes in connectivity? Um, that sort of comparative analysis allows us to look at frozen frames. Um, and in reality, evolution is a moving picture of life. And so I'm just taking little tiny frames and trying to put a story together. So in, in order to understand how transitions occur, we study development. There are developmental mechanisms that give rise to aspects of brain organization, like cortical field number and cortical field size and, and interconnections. Um, and these are being tweaked. These mechanisms are being tweaked um, in, during development in different species over time to generate the diversity that we see on the planet, planet Earth. So I'm going to focus my talk um, mainly on this issue. OK, so what am I comparing across brains? Well, I'm com comparing functional organization. I can stick an electrode into the brain, and I can see what, what do neurons want to respond to. Do they want to respond to visual information? If they want to respond to visual information, do they want to respond to motion? Tactile information, proprioceptive information, auditory information. Um, so I can make maps of the neocortex. There are, little, there are maps of the visual field in our brain. There are maps of the body surface in our brain. Um, I can compare cortical connections. How are these different maps interconnected with each other, with other uh, portions of the brain? Um, with subcortical structures, and I can look at cortical architecture. And cortical architecture is, is, is actually literally how the brain is constructed. I can look at how the cells are um, grouped. I can look at myelinated axons. I can look at the distribution of neurotransmitters. And I can combine these to try to understand um, um, how brains are similar and different across species. And I've done this for a number of years. And over, my mother would be so proud of me. So this is what 30 years of neuroscience is. This is, this is my contribution right here. Um, <laughs> Basically, this is a cladogram where it shows a tree of life, a common ancestor here. We don't know what the form of a common ancestor looked like, um, and different species along um, different branches of this tree. And you don't have to know what these cortical fields are called, but similar colors to uh, denote um, common uh, homologous brain areas, or brain areas that all species have inherited from, from a common ancestor. And there are a constellation of cortical fields that all species have, even if they don't use these cortical fields. So for example, you can have a blind mole rat that has skin grown over its eyes. Its eyes have become really, really small. But it still has a visual system. It still has what I can identify as a primary visual area with a unique pattern of connections or, or a pattern of connections that all species um, share with V1, suggesting that 
evolution is highly constrained. Brains can't become anything. They're saddled with some sort of constraints. And I won't talk about the constraints in this talk, but just be aware that we can, we can identify this constellation of cortical fields even if you're not using it. You, you, it might become smaller, um, um, but it doesn't go away. Obviously, brains have changed. This is a flattened view of a brain of a, of a macaque monkey. This is the front. This is the top. This is a little mouse brain. They're not trying to drawn to scale. Don't worry about what all these fields mean. Uh, homologous fields are shown in similar colors. And one thing that you're going to notice is that, well, this brain looks different. This brain looks different than this brain. There are a lot of cortical fields. Um, the relative size of some of these cortical fields is different. Um, the spatial lo location of the fields have changed. And my question is, how do these types of transformations occur throughout the course of time? What are the developmental mechanisms that give rise to these? Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of modifications to the neocortex. Um, this is a, a constant a, a, or a small list of systems level changes that have occurred to neocortices over time based on studies, uh, from, based on our comparative studies. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a couple. One is we notice that there are changes in sensory domain allocation. What that means is you have a cortical sheet and it's divvied up. It's divvied up into portions that process visual information, portions that process auditory information, portions that process somatosensory information. If I look across different species, the amount of cortex devoted to processing visual information is really different compared to the amount of cortex devoted to processing somatosensory information. And I'll give you a really nice example of that. Um, I'm also going to talk today about magnification of beha behaviorally relevant body parts. This is for the somatosensory system, but our brain gives a lot of cortical territory to things that are important. So for example, in humans, there's a lot of space devoted to representing my hands. There's a lot of space devoted to representing my lips and my tongue. If I'm an echolocating bat, there's a ton of space devoted to representing not just my auditory system, but ultras ultrasonic frequencies like 80,000 hertz, for example. So you have this magnification of beha behaviorally relevant body parts um, and or sensory effectors. Or, receptors on your body. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about connections and differences in connections and how they arise. Okay, I'm doing pretty well here. Um, my movie doesn't work, so I'm going to move on. That was my, my like artsy thing. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we missed out. So, so the first question is, what factors contribute to these modifications? Genes. Inheritance, right? Um, there are genes intrinsic to the developing neocortex. They're slightly tweaked in different lineages that can change aspects of connectivity or as aspects of sensory domain allocation. Um, there are genes extrinsic to the neocortex, but intrinsic to the animal, that, that change body morphology. They can be tweaked or changed. They can generate changes to the neocortex. I'm going to focus mainly on the epigenetic stuff. This is alterations in gene expression that occur, that are activity dependent. They're totally context dependent. They're not inherited through tra traditional evolutionary mechanisms. The studies we're doing in my, in, in my laboratory right now are, can we induce some of the modifications that I had in the previous slide by tweaking a developing nervous system and generating a phenotype that is consistent with what evolution would produce? So sort of playing a little bit of evolution in the laboratory. OK, so first I'm going to talk about examples from the natural world. Then I'm going to talk about a little bit about experimental manipulations in perform morphology that we've done in the laboratory. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about natural vari variation and early experience within a population and how these things are changing the neocortex. So this is one of my favorite examples in the world, um, a ductal platypus. They have an extreme <coughs> morphological specialization called a bill. So I don't know if you guys know anything about a duck-billed platypus, but they have mechanosensory receptors or touch receptors that run in stripes on their bill. And these are interdigitated with electrosensory receptors. They can detect changes in current in the water. So when a platypus is doing anything important, like um, mating, um, finding prey, navigating in the environment, it closes its eyes, its ears, and its nose. So all it uses is its bill. So you can't really imagine what it's like to be a platypus. Um, but it's a very, very different experience. And if we look at its neocortex and the representation of its bill in the neocortex, so this is the cortical sheet that's been flattened out. This is rostral, or this is to the front, and this is to the top. This is what you call sort of a platypunculus or homunculus. You've probably heard of these. This is a representation of its body in, in somatosensory cortex. And this is a representation of its bill. This is a beautiful example of cortical magnification of a behaviorally relevant body part. If I look at other representations in somatosensory cortex, I see this huge representation of a bill here, a bill here. So if I take my entire cortical sheet and I look at the amount of cortex devoted to representing that bill, it's about 60 or 70% of the entire cortical sheet. So it's an extreme example of a mag magnification. Of course, the questions are, to what extent are these differences in cortex associated with differences in genes intrinsic to the neocortex that they're changing in this species, genes associated with the development of the body, epigenetic influence on, on body morphology. For example, 
diet and gravitational stress on bone density, sense, uh, the presence of sensory stimuli during development, and the use of that morphology. So the red are things that are traditional evolutionary mechanisms, and these are ep epigenetic mechanisms. So this is from another per person's lab. It's a really nice experiment where they've manipulated genes intrinsic to the neocortex in a developing animal. You don't have to know what that gene is. Um, but it's involved in the formation of cortical fields. When they overexpress this gene, this is what normal organization looks like in a mouse, the, a, a visual area, somatosensory auditory area. They've actually changed the size of the cortical field. They've made this cortical field larger and this cortical field smaller. So we know that genes intrinsic to the neocortex can generate some of these phenotypic changes. What's really cool, it's a really beautiful study of compar comparative um, bat and mouse limb um, development. Here's the uh, phenotype, body phenotype of a mouse versus that of a bat. It's re bat is really, really different. It has elongated fingers, interdigit membranes, specialized touch domes on those wings. And if we look at the development of the forelimb, there are a couple of key genes that are involved in forelimb development. In this case, I'm just showing you one where the expression pattern is slightly expanded in a bat versus a mouse, which can account for a number of changes in the, in the transformation of a forelimb into a wing. So a tiny little genetic tweak can generate huge phenotypic di um, diversity in terms of um, peripheral morphology. And if I look at the cortical representation of a bat, of course we all know that auditory cortex is really large, but if I look at the representation of the forelimb in this somatosensory area, the bat forelimb representation is huge compared to that of a mouse. Is that due to genes intrinsic to the neocortex, or is it simply a result of changing body morphology and use um, within this species? So to get at this question, we did experiments in which we changed peripheral morphology, um, uh, sorry, in which we changed um, peripheral morphology to get at this question. Before I get up, go on to that, I'd like to say that if you look at this, this sort of magnification that I just showed you, um, I've, I've given you examples of the ductal platypus. Um, there are a number of examples that occur in nature, but if we look at humans and we look at the specialization of the supralaryngeal tract, we can reinterpret what we consider as human specializations. For example, Broca's area is not uh, in, evolved de novo in humans, but it's following the same rules of evolution um, as other animal brains, and it's magnifying behaviorally relevant body parts, probably based on um, changes, genetic changes in peripheral morphology use, and there may, there may also be a, an intrinsic genetic component to the neocortex. Okay, so I want to get at this question a little bit by manipulating peripheral morphology in a developing animal and seeing what happens. So um, um, scientists are like artists. We look at the world, we, we give our interpretation. The difference is we poke the frog and, and then we see what happens. We, 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 just, we, we don't just depict it. We try to change it or manipulate it. And this is an, ex this is an example of where we do this. And the animal that we do this in is this little... Um, South American opossum called the um, Monodelpha semestica. It's a short-tailed opossum. The reason we use this animal is because this is what they look like when they're born. They are not, most of their development occurs ex utero. So they're basically like little embryos. So we can physically manipulate something in their developing nervous system to see if we can generate a phenotype that is consistent with what evolution would produce. So we're doing this before any of the connections have formed. And what we're doing is we're removing both eyes. The eyes aren't even developed yet. They're just little eye spots. We're letting the animals grow up, we're sticking electrodes in their brain, we're looking at what neurons want to respond to in what's supposed to be visual cortex, what are the connections of what's supposed to be visual cortex, to see if I can change proof morphology and induce some of those systems level changes I showed in the very beginning of this talk. And we measured, the first thing we did was measure the size of the cortical fields and, and the cortical sheet. Um, and what we found, this is just the normal animal, the bilateral nuclei, I think you can already see here. If we, architectonically, if we look at how this field looks, we can still identify what, what, what is V1, although it's not visual in nature, but it's a lot smaller. And, oops. And these are our, our, our measurements. I'm trying not to be too sciencey here. But here's the bottom line. S1 has gotten bigger. V1 has gotten smaller. The overall size of the cortical sheet hasn't changed. We've changed the size of cortical fields. And I'm going to show you some of the other things that we've done, which is pretty cool. We stuck an electrode in the brain. Every single one of these dots is an electrode penetration where we uh, presented the animal with a type of sensory stimulation, cranked up our amp amplifier, and listened to what neurons wanted to respond to. The blue indicates neurons responding to visual stimulation, red somatosensory, and green auditory stimulation. This is a normal animal, so visual cortex is visual, somatosensory cortex is somatosensory, and, audit and auditory cortex is interested in auditory stimuli. In a bilateral nuclei, these are two examples, 
all of what would normally be visual cortex is not just laying dormant. It's completely taken over um, by the somatosensory and auditory system. So these, these neurons are interested in somatosensory and auditory stimulation. So we've completely changed sensory domain allocation without doing anything to the neocortex itself. And note that even somatosensory cortex has been altered. If we look at this, the, the, the uh, parts, of, parts of the body represented in this reorganized V1, we see that it becomes this huge head and snout region that all those neurons are really interested in the head, the snout, and the face. So that, like the, like the platypus, a huge proportion of its cortex is devoted to representing those inputs. And if we look at the connections of what, we, what would be V1 um, in these bilateral nucleates, we see massive changes in subcortical and cortical connectivity. So we've completely transformed this cortex, as well as somatosensory cortex. So the point is, that we can do, we can, we, can, we can change the cortical phenotype in a radical way by doing nothing to the cortex itself. You should also take home that blindness is more than the absence of light. So you can't, I'm going to imagine what it's like to be a blind person. You can't. You can't just simply close your eyes because they're they um, <coughs> experiencing the world through a completely rewired nervous system. But there's a more subtle um, study that we were working on that we, we just started doing, which is really cool. Because removing the eyes is a radical thing to do. In the natural world, there are plenty of examples where we can use a model system that's going to answer our questions. This is the prairie vole. This is the prairie vole's correct face. The cool thing about the prairie vole is that they're, only, they're one of only 3% of mammals that are um, monogamous. They're biparental. Both parents rear the young. It turns out something really cool happens with prairie voles. In the natural world, they fall into different parental rearing styles. Um, there are parents that spend a lot of time with their young, and they contact them tactily a lot. And there are parents at this end of the distribution, distribution that don't spend as much time and don't contact, uh, use co tactile contact. So they fall in a normal distribution. So we look at these two groups. Um, and we can actually quantify the amount of contact that these two groups have. So this is you know, sensory differences in sensory stimulation coming into the developing nervous system, but delivered through uh, parental rearing styles. And these are just measures. And by contact, I mean um, huddling, uh, grooming, licking. Those sorts of things. And both mo the mother and the father do that. Um, and here's the cool thing about, here's the cool thing about bulls. If you're a prairie vole high contact baby, you become a prairie vole high contact parent. If you're a low contact baby, you become a low contact parent. You have differences in social behavior when you're ju juveniles. And I'm not saying one is better versus the, than the other, but here's the cool thing. If I cross foster, if I take high contact babies and put them with low contact parents on the day of birth, they become high contact parents. So parenting style is culturally transmitted. So our question is, what do their brains look like? Mm -hmm. And it turns out if you map the somatosensory cortex, you see a huge representation in high contact of this perioral structure, which is one of the regions that are get, receiving a lot of contact. And if you look at cortical connectivity, this is just a graphic representation where these are connections of S1, moderate connections with this field, this field, this field. And I look at the connections in a low contact, I have additional connections that I can quantify in both hemispheres that I don't see, okay, I'm just about done, that I don't see in um, high contact animals. So by doing something much more subtle and changing the amount of contact that I get as a child, as a, as a, as a baby bull, <laughs> I can change functional organization of the neocortex, I can change cortical connectivity, and I'm only looking at two cortical fields. So that, um, I'm, I won't go through, into that. So that um, the point is that we can't consider cortical evolution or phenotypic changes across species without appre appreciating within life changes to the phenotype. Um, species obviously evolve, but some features of organization can masquerade as traditional evolutionary changes. But these features, features are actually context dependent and can persist for thousands of years if the environment, physical sensory environment in which the, indiv the individual develops. <laughs> is stable. What are the factors that, the better question is not how evolution builds a complex brain, but what are the factors that contribute to the phenotype? Genes, we've already said, show, I've shown you differences in cortical field size, connections and morphology. The environment, those same things. I've given you examples of the build, the platypus, the lung and uh, the tongue, larynx and lips of the human, but things like social learning, language and culture are, always, are also going to be um, contributing to the, the phenotype, but these are complex patterns of physical stimuli that vary during development and throughout evolution. I just want to leave you with one last slide, which is really sort of complicated at first. This is a cladogram of human evolution. 
On the top are morphological changes that have, have, occur, that have occurred over time, and on the bottom are environmental or social con, uh, con contextual changes. What I want to show you is about 700,000 years ago, the modern hand and, and changes to the hive, which is involved in speech production, were present morphologically. Um, around this time, we were just learning to control fire. Modern language may have started to evolve, although that's uh, questionable. Really important is 195,000 years ago was the earliest anatomically identified modern human. We haven't changed. This hasn't changed at all. So we haven't changed um, in 200,000 years in terms of our genes and in terms of the morphology of our bodies. But if you look at our social or, or, or our social evolution, it's snowballed. And if you believe that all behavior is generated by the brain, then our behavior has radically changed. And I mean, the Industrial Revolution was less than 200, year, 200 years ago. Then, then the brain must have changed. And if the brain hasn't changed due to changes in gene sequence, then it must have changed due to cultural evolution via some of the mechanisms that I talk, just talked about. OK, so this is my lab, and I'm done. <laughs>